Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of the sixth middle game lesson in the video series where we are looking at the bishop. In the first video we looked at the three types of bishops that you can have in your game, meaning an active bishop, a useful bishop, and a tall pawn bishop. In this video we're going to take a look at how to effectively use the bishop in your game and how to fight against it. If you possess a lazy bishop that's just sitting around daydreaming, you have to find a way to put it to work. And we're going to train how to do this in the following examples as well. This next position, it's part of a 30 minute internet game played by two students and it's very instructive. If we look at this position, we could see that white is putting a lot of pressure on d6 with the two rooks. However, it's well defended by the knight and the queen. We could also notice that the bishop on e2, it's not that active right now. He has no squares to go on on the d1 to h5 diagonal and he's also stuck on the f1 to a6 diagonal by the pawn on c4. And here white played the excellent move that makes a teacher proud with the move c5. This pawn sacrifice allows the bishop to go on c4 now where he's going to be extremely active. It also opens up the d file for the two double brooks. So this pawn sacrifice isn't a free pawn you are gaining positional advantage. And after c5, the game continued with d takes on c5, white moved the rook to d7, queen to e8, bishop to c4, activating the bishop with the powerful attack on the king, rook to b8, queen to f6, b5, bishop to e6, b6, and then rook to e7, from which black resigned as checkmate cannot be prevented. So you could see here how important it is to activate your pieces and use them together to a common goal. Coming back from the beginning after c5, I do want to mention that even black's best reply would still lead to a winning position for white. And I'm just going to skim quickly through the positions that I've got from the game analysis with an engine. So after rook to a to d8 and then going on through the moves will lead white with this position right here where he is totally winning. Here black cannot even take on f2 because after that rook takes on d3 and if black takes the rook, white takes the other rook and pawn to d2 does not work as the king and the bishop can reach the pawn before promoting. Another effective way to use an active bishop is setting up a battery with the queen. So here after queen to e4 white is totally winning. The threat is obviously queen to h7 checkmate. If black tries to stop this with g6, well after this the dark square bishop could take on h6. After something like knight takes on e5, hitting the queen with the bishop, the queen can take on b7. After the knight takes the bishop on d3, queen to a6 attacks the knight and also the rook on f8 is being attacked. So if the knight retreats let's say something like knight to b2, we're simply going to take the rook and after bishop takes on f8, rook to a1, we're also going to be able to win the knight as well. Coming back, we've looked at pawn to g6, didn't work. If black replies with something like f5, here white will be able to take on passant, e takes f6. After rook takes f6, rook to e1 and now black has two tries, knight to a5 or queen to d7. We're going to take a look at both. After queen to d7, we're going to play queen takes h7, king f7, bishop g5. And here, he can respond to different ways. If he takes the bishop on g5, then knight takes on g5, check, king e8, queen to g8, check. And here, after rook to f8, we'll be able to do knight takes e6, rook takes the queen, and then bishop to g6 is checkmate. And coming back, if instead of moving the rook to f8, black replies here with bishop to f8. Then we do knight takes e6, rook takes e6, rook takes e6, king d8, queen takes f8, check, king to c7. And after queen to f5, white is up in exchange and totally winning. And coming back, we looked at queen to d7 here. If black plays instead knight to a5, then queen to h7, check, king f7, bishop to g5. Again here, black can try to take the bishop or queen to g8. If he does take the bishop, Knight takes g5, we're going to get a similar position, king to e8, knight takes on e6, rook to e6, queen g8, check, king d7, queen takes e6, king c7, and then queen takes e7 with the totally winning position. 
or coming back if he doesn't take the bishop here if he plays instead queen to g8 try to exchange the queens to alleviate the pressure well here we could do bishop takes f6 queen takes h7 bishop takes h7 bishop takes f6 and after bishop to e4 white is again totally winning being up in exchange active bishops are nice but at times they cover squares that are not as important because there's not much going on on those diagonals in that case you have to find or create something for them to do the dream bishop is both useful and active it covers a lot of ground but it also serving a very specific useful purpose this position was reached after 10 moves in a game played by Valkatin versus Pelletier in 2005. White's dark square bishop is active in that it eyes two diagonals, the g1 to a7 and the c1 to h6. However, the g1 to a7 diagonal is blocked. The pawn on b6 is a rock. And then the c1 to h6 diagonal has nothing to do with the battle for the central dark squares. The d6 square in particular is screaming for the bishop's attention. In other words, the bishop is active but not performing a useful function that relates to the other imbalances in the position. Of course, white's potential dark square control is offset by the weak pawns on the c file, so black has his chances too. Nevertheless, even if the chances are more or less balanced, it's still up to white to pose problem for his opponent by acting on the positive imbalances for what they're worth. In this game, after 26 minutes thought, Grandmaster Volokatin played the most principled move, bishop to c1. He's heading for a3 and ultimately d6. Now black has to be very careful that his king doesn't get stuck in the center. And here black reply with the fine move e5. This move chases the queen off its powerful central post. Now white moved the queen to d2, and then black castled bishop a3, rook to e8, and now bishop to b5. And here black replied with a6, from which white moved the bishop to d6, the square he was heading for, and went on winning this game. And I'm just going to fast forward through the moves so you can see the end of the game. And here black resigned coming back instead of moving the pawn to a6 here black could have fought for an equal position with rook to e6 guarding the d6 square and after something like c4 bishop b7 white would have castled on the queen side this would have been a mostly equal position so as we've seen in this game having a active bishop might look good but we want to make sure that it's also useful following the imbalances of the position. This next position was reached after 16 moves by another student that was rated 1658 in a blitz game. Here white played the move f6 which forces the bishop to h8 where it will lay for the rest of the game. This bishop will pretty much look like he's buried alive. As we mentioned earlier, such a bishop allows white to confidently play on the king side, the center, or the queen side, since he will have a piece more taking part in the battle. And the game continued with bishop to f3, knight f4, bishop takes f4, e takes f4, knight e takes f4, knight e5, knight e7, king f8, and then bishop to e2, where black resigned. Now not just beginners end up with a bishop that is a tall pawn. This next game is played by Grandmaster Alexander Grischuk versus Grandmaster Christian Bauer in 2005. This position was reached after just 15 moves, and the problem with Black's position is the bishop on g6, which looks like a tall pawn, doesn't it? Here Black's bishop cannot come to h5, as White's queen is preventing him from doing that, and also if he moves the pawn from f7 to f6, making room for the bishop, the bishop retreating to e8 doesn't really have much going on either and plus that will make the pawn on e6 very weak. So from here the game continued with knight to g2 stopping bishop takes h4 and getting ready to hop into f4. Also preparing to torment black's bishop with h2 to h4 and then to h5 trapping the bishop. From here black reply knight to d5, knight to f4 castle queenside rook f to e1 
here the rook eyes e5 and also it's a prophylactic move preventing black from playing f7 to f6 as the e6 pawn will fall so here the game continued with knight takes on f4 bishop takes f4 bishop d6 bishop takes on d6 queen takes d6 and then rook to e5 while black's bishop is pretending it's a pawn white's bishop will serve an active role in the center and on the queen side it will never have to worry about being challenged by the bishop on g6 as he is trapped white's rook to e5 not only prepares to double up on the e-file but it also prevents a potential c6 to c5 break i want you to notice how white isn't in a hurry he's trying to stop the enemy's counterplay first and then he's preparing for his own decisive queenside breakthrough so here the game continued with king to b8 bishop to c4 this makes a way for the advance on his b pawn rook h to e8 hoping to play f7 to f6 with e6 to e5 to follow but white replied here with rook a to e1 white is blocking any counterplay from black from here the game continues with rook to e7 b4 and here he's preparing for a queenside breakthrough black replied with rook to c7 pawn to h4 h5 and now white played the move a4 queen to f8 queen to f4 this freezes the f5 pawn takes aim at the enemy king along the h2 to b8 diagonal and denies black's queen use of the h6 square the rest of the game i'm just going to skim through the moves so you can see how it ended and here black resigned so you could see you always need to think twice before placing your pawns on the same color as your bishop in general you should only do this if your bishop can get outside the pawn chain which would make it active or if your bishop is proving useful most likely as a defender inside the chain of course with all the knowledge and good intentions in your game this won't stop you having a bishop as a tall pawn from time to time if this occurs you need to first of all get your pawns off the collar of your bishop unblocking it or get your bishop outside the pawn chain or exchange that horrible bishop for an enemy bishop or knight this next position was reached after 13 moves in another game played by two students rated 1823 and 1938 in this game both white and black have a bishop that's a tall pawn white has the bishop on g2 while black has the bishop on g7 in this game white just moved the rook from a1 to c1 failing his bishop exam his g2 bishop isn't very happy so white needs to activate the thing by getting it outside of the pawn chain a bishop to h3 is the correct idea he's going to get the bishop outside of the pawn chain and this also stops the potential knight to g4 move after white pushes the pawn to f4 and it also prevents black from moving his rook on the open c file from here black replied with queen to b6 and now white played the move f4 here white is only thinking of checkmating his opponent probably bishop to h3 does not even enter his mind after f4 black replied with knight to d7 knight to g4 here was much better heading for e3 where the knight will be super active in white's camp but knight to d7 was played from here white played the move f5 again bishop to h3 it's still better and after f5 black replied with f6 from which white here moved the bishop to h6 which was not a really good move the correct play here is actually f takes on g6 unlocking the h3 to c8 diagonal now it's true that here white will sacrifice a bishop but this opens up a lot of opportunities after the pawn takes the bishop on g5 white will reply with g takes h7 check and now black has two ways to respond if he takes the pawn with the king we have rook to f7 after queen to d8 and rook to c7 queen takes on c7 queen takes on g5 and now checkmate cannot be prevented 
if black doesn't defend his bishop on g7, the queen will simply take it. And the only piece to defend it is the rook coming to g8. But after queen to h5, this is checkmate also. And coming back after g takes h7 check, if the king moves to h8, here white can reply rook to f7 again, queen to d8, bishop to h3, using the diagonal that opened up now, knight to c5, b4, knight to a6, bishop to c8. An excellent move. After rook takes on c8 and rook takes back, the queen is now forced to take that rook, and now queen takes on g5. Same story, the checkmate cannot be prevented. So after a bishop to h6, here black also made a terrible move, retreating the bishop to h8. Much better here is moving the pawn to g5, after which white will exchange the bishop, king takes on g7, and black got rid of his bishop that was really a tall pawn, which a much better active position. So after the bishop went back to h8, white took on g6, h takes g6, and now finally white woke up and he moved the bishop to h3. And now I'm just going to continue to see how strong this bishop became and how white won the game from here. I'm just going to skim through the moves so you could see how this game ended. And this is checkmate. And you saw how active that bishop became after he got activated on the h3 to c8 diagonal. This just goes to show that knowing strategic concepts in a theoretical sense is one thing, while being able to actually notice it and put it into use in a real battle situation is quite another. Make no mistake about it, this inability to turn knowledge into a practical application goes right up the rating ladder. If you're gonna go through this video series in the middle game and you're gonna apply these principles, you're gonna see the huge impact on your rating. If you like my video, please subscribe and don't forget to check out my new website, MasterYourChess.com, where you can learn, practice, test, and master your chess knowledge.